Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I just wanted to talk a little bit about our program and then introduce our speaker. My name is Tracy Lord. I'm a diabetes nurse educator, and I'm the diabetes program coordinator at Carson Valley Medical Center here in Gardnerville. What happened is last year I took a vacation tra and traveled through Gardnerville and I thought, gosh, that would be a beautiful place to live. And lo and behold, here I am. I found out that uh, Carson Valley Medical Center didn't have a diabetes program, so we started one up and we uh, have just a, had our anniversary. Uh, we uh, have been open almost a year now. And we got our national recognition from the American Diabetes Association. So I'm really proud that we have a quality program to serve people in the community and in the rural areas. So I, I welcome you to embrace diabetes and learn all you can about it so that you can stay healthy. It's a very silent disease. There's 21 million people that have it in the U.S., including you and me. Uh, I have had type 1 diabetes for 28 years. I got it in nursing school and college and decided to make a career out of it. So that way you can stay healthy and I can stay healthy because we're in this together. And in or if you would like to come through our program, uh, most insurances cover it now that we're recognized by the American Diabetes Association. If you're interested, you need to contact your primary care physician and just have him send a referral over, him or her, and then we'll give you a call. We formed a multidisciplinary team in our facility, and that way we can serve all your needs so that nothing gets missed. We have uh, myself, I'm a nurse, a registered nurse. We have our dietitian, who's also a certified diabetes educator. We have our pharmacist, we have our social worker, we have a wound care nurse, podiatrist, and of course our medical director who is an endocrinologist uh, who practices in Reno. Uh, so I welcome all of you and I hope you can make uh, the most of your time here and I encourage you to live life to the fullest. Uh, the whole value of learning about diabetes is to stay healthy, prevent the complications, and have a lot of energy to enjoy life. I would like to introduce our speaker, Chet Cox, and he's from Missouri. I'm from Oklahoma originally. Right. I'm all around. He's a traveler, and he's going to share his story on, on how he deals with diabetes effectively. And, uh, of course, life isn't perfect, but... We can learn from others and their experiences, and it kind of motivates us to hear things like that. So I'll let you begin, Chet. Thank you, Tracy. Well, as she said, I'm Chet. Howdy. Howdy. They tell me I'm your facilitator. That's a highfalutin $20 word that means I'm going to talk for about 20 or so minutes and then turn it over to you all for questions. Now, if you've all finished those green sheets like this says here, those of you who have not torn them off, remember I asked you not to tear them off just yet? Who hasn't torn them off yet? Oh, you've all, okay. Just, I was going to get everyone to tear them off all at once. It makes a great sound. <laughs> anyway, if, you, if you tear them off the top and move them towards the center, I'll come wandering down and pick them up. If I'm going too fast, by the way, because we folks from Oklahoma tend to talk fast, you know, do something to try to get me to slow down. You don't want to slow me down too much because we'll be here longer, and I don't know anyone who wants to listen to me that long. Now, if you have any questions, now that you've torn off your green sheets, you'll notice you've got line note paper there. If you have any questions, instead of you know, asking them right in the middle of the presentation, write them down, because we're going to have question and answer afterwards. And this way, just in case the presentation answers your question, you won't have to bother with it, and you won't forget it. Your handout also has copies of many of the slides we're going to be doing today and some things about journaling we're going to be talking about. I'd really like to thank Tracy for bringing me down here, and Tom for hosting me and inviting me. See, I'm here as an A1C champion because, well, I'm just like you folks. I have diabetes. Trying to get along with it, finally got it under control, and now I'm going out and trying to help other folks learn how to take control because, well, we don't have a cure, but as far as I'm concerned, and the way I feel, control is as good as a cure for me. 
Right now, if you've got to have diabetes, well, this is a great time to. There's so many things being discovered. It's like every week the picture changes again. Not too long ago, we didn't even know about anything called the A1C. How many here knows what the A1C is? Right. How many here knows what your A1C is? Good move. Hey, you're, you're learning them real good there. For those of you who ain't learned yet, the A1C stands for something long and unpronounceable. But what it really means is that it's a blood test to where they can take the average, find the average of what your blood sugar has been for the past two to three months. Now, you compare that with, you take your finger sticks, you have those all written down, you have your A1C numbers, and your primary physician or your healthcare team can really give you a good picture of what's going on, and then Tracy can help you prepare a plan of living to where you'll be able to live it to the best. This chart gives you an idea of Oh, pretty much how the A1C, which is expressed in percentiles, compares to our finger sticks, our blood glucose readings. Nearly like 10% here means you've got an average of about 275. What we're after, according to the American Diabetes Association, is that 7 there. 7 or below, which would be 170 blood glucose or low. I don't know about you, but I much prefer being down here. <laughs> I like being around 100 instead of up at 170. But I will tell you this. We have learned that, say, the difference between 8% and 7%, and that's just a 1%, one digit on the A1C, that's 40% less chances of getting the complications come with diabetes. 40% less opportunity of having something go wrong with our heart, or our feet, or our fingers, or some other extremities, or any or having your own dialysis. Don't even want to think about that. I can use that extra 40%, so I stay below 7, I'll tell you. Now, how many of us here have diabetes? All right. I was going to ask how many of us are here just with friends or as supporters of folks with diabetes. Any, any supporters here? Love you guys. Couldn't do it without you. I'm dead serious about that because we cannot have diabetes by ourselves. I want to tell you that this can be done. It can be done with the help of you and these supporters we've just talked about. And, of course, your health care team, Tracy and your doctors, and us, the A1C champions, here to just tell you what it's like living with diabetes. This is sponsored by Aventus Pharmaceuticals, and that's the last you're going to be hearing about them because I am not doing any commercials. This is going to be different from a lot of things you set through. We're going to be talking about some helpful, practical ideas on self-control, and I don't mind telling you, going around giving these presentations, kind of reminds me and helps me to stay in control. I don't mind telling you, if I wasn't in control, I couldn't take all this travel. It'd kill me. I really don't like the travel. Flying used to be fun. It's not anymore. <laughs> the planes are always late, and you're, you know, you're right here at the gate, and then they tell you your plane's at the other end of a different terminal and everything. You've got to run back and forth. I hate it. The planes are... I do this because... I've seen this program work. I do this because I believe that we can help each other and that diabetes is completely controllable. That's how strongly I believe in it. I went through the same things you all did. You know, first of all, I denied it. Hey, doc, <laughs> your lab report's wrong. I don't have di the lab report's wrong. You got somebody else's numbers there. And then, of course, you know, the, well, I promise I'll do anything. Just don't put me on insulin or... Don't make me do this, or don't make me exercise, or <laughs> anything like that. And then I went into the self-pitying thing. Yeah, I've been through it all. I want to tell you there is light. There is definitely light, and this really works. I was diagnosed in 2000. Looking at my medical records, the doc said that I must have had it for at least 12 years prior to that. At least. So that was at least 12 years that diabetes had a chance to do its number on me. It wasn't until after, you know, about that time that suddenly I started having symptoms. Having diabetes all this time, no symptoms. That's not fun. That happens to all of us, though. So that's why we've got to measure and keep track. These symptoms surprise us when they happen. So that's about it. I, I just made sure at that point, once I got past the self-pity, once I started learning a little bit more through our diabetes support group, I sort of compared it to my pancreas being a transmission. The guys will go along with this. Standard transmissions, 
are fun. Automatic transmissions do all the thinking for you in your car. They shift when they want to and everything like this. Well, that's how my pancreas used to work. My pancreas have a clutch. I've got to keep track of what I'm doing, of what I'm eating, and how much insulin I take in, along with carbohydrates and such. Frankly, I've always liked standard transmission cars better than automatics anyway. So, I've had diabetes for at least 19 years now, going on 20. And I went through all those things you, talk, you have talked about them just now. And th this is why, come on, this is the stuff we heard about when we first heard about diabetes, that you have to take medicine. You have to stick your fingers to test your blood sugars. You have to lose weight. You have to balance the food you eat. You have to exercise. You have to go to your doctor regularly, and you might have to give yourself insulin shots. Boy, howdy, don't that make you want to run right out and get diabetes? Exciting stuff. Blah! Well, I, I don't mind telling you, of all that, I hated the exercise the most. I was a little squeamish about the insulin, but I got over it. We're going to provide you with some right now resources to help you get to where you want to be, to help you make the choices you want to, because diabetes does not rule us. Matter of fact, I told you a minute ago I'd be showing you my reasons for going to all this trouble, and there's my reasons. There's a couple of folks who aren't there right now, aren't there in the picture because they were born later. To my middle daughter and her husband was born a little baby boy of about 10 pounds a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. And just this past year in May, little Kara was born. Kara was also a whopper of a baby and grew even bigger later. Neither of them were fat, they were just huge. So, we all know, who knows anything about gestational diabetes, what the possibilities are of her getting diabetes when she's around 40. Plus, she has a father with diabetes and a mother with diabetes. Now, the bullets are heavily arranged against her. These three grandchildren here not only have a grandfather and a grandmother with diabetes, their father is full-blood Native American. Okay, they've got a lot of bullets. As a matter of fact, when this boy was eight, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And let me tell you about this boy. Little Gabriel, he's a little bigger now. He's a young man now, really. But at eight years old, he was the one who was checking all the carbohydrates and the food labels when they went to the grocery. He stuck his fingers on a regular basis, took his insulin without a whimper, even did show and tell about how he stuck his fingers and recorded things. And now he's, uh, you know, he, he, about a year later, he got on the pump, and he loves his pump because now he can go up in the mountains and go camping again. He does all this, he told his mother, my oldest daughter, says he wants to be like Grandpa. I think it's not important that I do things right, show him the right example. You bet it is. Well, brothers and sisters, somebody you love right now is looking at you, and if and when they get diabetes, and remember, they have greater odds to get it because you have it, they're looking at you right now, and you will be their example. Be their champion for them. Be ready for that when it happens. We're going to be talking about three themes, as if we haven't already sort of addressed them. How does it matter? Well... We think it matters whether you feel good or feel lousy, don't you? We're going to talk about information that's practical. We're going to talk about why it's a good idea to keep our A1C under 7. and Why insulin? Why this? Why that? Well, good decisions come from understanding the consequences. So we'll talk about those consequences. It's up to you. Well, that's because I can't make you do anything. I can stand up here and talk to them blue in the face. Won't make a bit of difference to you. I bet your mom doesn't live with you anymore, so she can't keep track of you. You're the only one who can actually live your life and live your life experiences. And three, we're not alone because diabetes is such a huge influence, has such a large impact on our lives that it affects the people around us. Not just our immediate family, but our neighbors, our coworkers, everyone. Help these people become part of the solution. Now here's my second favorite slide because it reminds us of how incredible our bodies are. You know, mine was a lot more incredible when I was 18, but it's, you know. You know, what we have and what we are basically comes from the balance between the fuels we take in, carbohydrates, which is just a long, highfalutin name for sugars, 
carbohydrates and fats turn into sugar just as soon as they hit that bloodstream, which is going to match up to our physical activity. If our activity and our carbohydrates or fats or sugar, whichever way you want to put it, intake match up, we're real healthy. We're really feeling good as long as our body is producing enough insulin or we have enough insulin in there to get that energy to this activity. Mind you, of course, we know what happens when we're out of balance. Uh, we take in too much fuel and don't have any activity. Well, I'm working at it. If we don't have the right amount of insulin, we're either going to feel lousy and tired or we're going to feel, well, lousy and tired. A high makes you feel lousy. A low blood glucose makes you feel lousy. We want to be right in there in the middle and have that balance to where we're in good control with the amount of insulin and glucose matching our level of physical exertion. And that's going to look something like this here. Now, mainly, these two white lines here represent where we want to stay all the time. You can tell when this person had something to eat, bing, it goes up a bit, bing, it goes up a bit, bing, it goes up a bit, but it comes right back down into the right levels. This person has a nice, steady level to where they're going to have, oh, well, probably an A1C of somewhere oh, below 7%. Can't say exactly where just yet without playing with the numbers. But as opposed to this, there's the white lines again. Whee! Look at this, 475, 425, 490. This is danger, danger, Will Robinson type territory. This person's definitely going to have an A1C well above 7% at this rate. To control our diabetes means we match what we're eating. We match it with our physical activity and our insulin on an ongoing basis. Our meter readings tell how well balanced we were at that given moment. The A1C level tells us how balanced we may have been over the past two to three months on an average because there's many times we're not sticking our fingers. I'm hoping we're sleeping about eight hours a night. So we put these two together and we can get a well-rounded picture of where we are. <sighs> now, we're talking about it's up to me, the second theme. Now I know this looks like algebra, but don't zone out on me, it's not. What we're just saying is that an event, in this case, diabetes, we have diabetes, plus our response, whatever we do about it, equals our outcomes. You know, usually we focus on the outcomes in life. Oh, I feel terrible. I feel great, or my A1C is, you know, 6, or my A1C is 25, you know. Either way, we're looking at the outcome, and that's not really where we should be looking. Because the outcome is determined by one thing we cannot control. That's locked in stone. That's set in type. That is diabetes. We've got it. It ain't going away. We're probably not going to see a cure in our lifetime. But what we do about it makes all the difference in the world. That can look something like this. Let's take some numbers here and plug them in. You know, 5 plus 4, that equals 9, doesn't it? Always has, always will. Can't do a thing about it. Cannot make 5 plus 4 equal anything less than 9. Let's say that 5 represents our diabetes. It's locked in place. Well, I can complain about the diabetes all I want to, but that 9 is still going to be 9. The only thing I can change is my response. Let's say that's represented by the 2 and that puts us down at 7. And remember the 7 and below is where we want to be. We talk about folks that oh, often have the same event happen in their lives. You've probably known two people at least who have had the same event happen in their lives and their outcomes, what happened after that was entirely different because of their responses. You get two people that win the lottery for a million dollars Guarantee you one of them's going to spend it and go out of their mind and end up in debt. The other person might save it, go to financial counselor, figure out how to live it, with it, how to live on the interest, and just end up being semi-retired the rest of his life. Two different people, exact same event, different response, different outcome. If I want something better than feeling sick or angry or like I don't have control, I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to have to respond differently. We can't blame diabetes. You know, the healthy response, that may be good eating, activity, reducing sweat, or reducing stress. Reducing sweat, boy, that came out of nowhere. Our outcome would be better control. We can't blame the diabetes because that doesn't do a bit of good. 
We can change the outcome, because if we don't like it, if I don't like an A1C that's high, I know what to do about it. Ultimately, you're the one who decides whether to take action and what to do. <coughs> Ultimately, it's always your choice. I could tell I'm back in dry country. We always, always have a choice about our attitudes. Now, does this look familiar to anyone? This is where I like to say, welcome to the deja vu portion of the show. Welcome to the deja vu portion of the show. You see some things up there? You see anything that you um, feel like you have to do and you don't want to do? <coughs> you know, we can take, take a look at that and we can take an attitude of, oh, I have to do this or I choose to do this. How about I have to stick my fingers three or four times a day to get my blood glucose levels, my sugar levels. I have to stick them three times a day and it hurts and it's a mess and I can't remember where I put my log and I can write it down. Or I choose to stick my fingers two to three times a day. I choose to so that I'll know where I'm at. I'll know what I can eat and what I can't and I won't go blind probably like my grandmother did. How about, oh, I have to give myself insulin shots. I hate giving myself shots. The needles are so big. Yeah, you can tell somebody else gets his needles from the VA. Hey. <laughs> or I choose to give myself insulin shots to reduce my blood sugar and conquer and to reach my goals. I like conquering. I like being in charge. Earlier I spoke about worrying about giving myself a shot. Boy, was I surprised. Even with those VA needles... <laughs> I'll give myself an injection. I have to look in the mirror half the time to see if, you know, to see if it's really, if I've really done it. Because I can't feel it. I found out in here there's hardly a nerve to speak of. So that's where I use it. <laughs> I'm a coward. I'll go ahead and use it where it doesn't hurt. Instead of failing, I felt like I was winning a battle once I was doing this. I like winning. And you know what? It really is a game for me. It is because I can take out my meter and I can check my score at any time. And I can tell when I'm winning and when I'm not. And when I'm not, I know what to do about it. So using have to or choose to is a reflection of our attitude. And it affects our attitude and our well-being. When I think have to, I'm saying someone or something has control over me. It's not really true, now is it? There's nothing we have to do if we're willing to take the consequences. So we can take the determination to change our attitudes to work with what were our habits and our patterns. These are the choices. We can choose to or we can have to. I prefer to choose to. I can realize I have a choice about what my attitude is going to be. Then I can do something about it. I have the choice. I'm not in control. You know, I'm not some, have something in control that tells me what my attitude must be. I can see the benefit, the external or internal, of doing a task. For instance, I'm on a goal to lose a complete 50 pounds of weight. You want to know why? Well, other than the fact that I'll feel swell. But, you know, for us guys, feeling swell, that's not much of a, you know, because we get out of a shower, look in the mirror, we go, yeah, you know, we're always, we always see ourselves at 18 or something. <laughs> no, my wife cut her hair short not too long ago. If I lose the full 50 pounds, she grows her hair back long and sexy again. Get yourself a goal that will mean something to you. See the benefit of doing this. Consciously decide what your attitude is going to be. Or are you going to go around, oh, I have to do this. Come on, you sound like a teenager when you do that. <laughs> or choose to. Be a grown-up. Choose to do that, which makes us feel great. And then practice. Practice and practice as often as possible until it becomes a habit. <coughs> right now, there's no cure for diabetes. We'll probably have it the rest of our lives and we will learn to live with and live very well with it. So it's particularly helpful to look at the habits we have that may help or harm our diabetes. You know, habits, we all have them. <coughs> Psychiatrists tell us that it takes oh, something like about two to three weeks of doing the same thing over and over and over, a task until it becomes a habit. But then once it becomes a habit, well, it's like this. Who here used a checklist this morning to brush your teeth? You had to at some point. When you first learned, you didn't you? Then it became a habit. Well, so how that matter? Well, we're talking about a lifelong condition here. We're talking about trying to develop habits that will do good for us. 
So when we start a new behavior like bleh, exercise, or wee, taking insulin, I love my insulin, then it takes a lot of focus and a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Then after about three to four weeks, we build it into a solid habit. Then it's harder to break that habit. It becomes relatively easy. It's sort of like an investment, and it's a really good investment. So we'll look at a few techniques and habits we might think about here. Oh, I love this. This looks extensive, and it might drive you just a little bit crazy. This is the concept of journaling. When I first started getting serious about my diabetes, I kept track of everything. So about two to three weeks, I tracked everything, and I discovered that right here, stress and mood changes, stress was affecting me even more than what I ate, even more than any physical activity. I found stress was causing this to happen with my blood glucose. So I started learning relaxation techniques and learned to let go of things that really didn't matter as much as feeling good. Once I got done after about oh, three weeks or so of tracking everything, mainly I just tracked these three things. Now, finger sticks, what uh, insulin or medicines I'm taking, signs of any glucose, and usually I'll write down what I'm eating. Any time I start seeing a lot of low or high blood glucose readings, man, I go back to doing everything again until I keep track of it. And I'm on the road a lot doing these things, so I've got to keep track. You might want to try this. You'll find some notes about this in your packet. <coughs> track everything intensively for a few weeks and see what pattern you find. See what will make better things for you. <coughs> Now, in the, book you'll be taking, uh, in the book that you will be getting in the mail, I should say, you'll read a little bit more about the concept of journaling, and I would urge you, please, please, to consider journaling so you'll have a record and right there in front of you showing you what works and what doesn't work for you. The journal, the purple books we have, we've run out again. They've gone back to press. If you put your name and address on that, Sign-in sheet back there that has a yellow highlight at the top. We'll make sure we mail you one just as soon as it comes in. I cannot brag about that book enough. That is that good. <clears throat> now, until we get that book and other resources, this is one of the things we'll be talking about. The journal here. You'll see this in your packet, too. You'll ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish? What is the big picture? What do you really want to accomplish? Well, this person says it's to keep their A1C under 7, and that's a heck of a good goal. But you can have your own goal. Her reason is she wants to protect her eyesight. But just knowing what you want to do doesn't get it done. So we start talking about what we're actually going to do. She's going to find out what her A1C is now. And the reason for that is, remember, she was worried about her eyes. If it's over 7, she knew she could be damaging her eyes. And now we get into the specifics of the task. What exactly does she stand around and do? She's going to ask her doctor what her A1C level is at the new visit next week. Break it down into actually what you can do, measurable little tasks, and only you know do two or three or so at a time. Make it something that you can do and something you can feel good about when you get it done. By the way, have you spoken to them about the idea of an accountability partner, Tracy? Oh, good. I get to talk about that. An accountability partner is somebody who, well, Let's say you're an accountability partner for him up here. Let's say today he tells you his three goals he wants to perform and finish by next week at this time. You write them down or remember them if you're really good and better than me at memory. Come this time next week, you call up or visit him. Say, you got 15 minutes, I'm going to ask you, how did you do on your goals? If he didn't uh, get them done or whatever, you tattle on him to his wife. That's what my accountability partner does. That's basically it's somebody who will hold us accountable. It's great if you can be accountability partners for each other, but that's not necessary. A loved one, <coughs> spouse, family member, a friend, anyone who will work with you on this. Uh, my accountability partner and I keep in touch via email because they're all the way up at Spanish Fork in Utah and I'm all the way out in Missouri. And therefore, we keep track just over the... We haven't seen each other in years. By the way, while I'm, while I'm thinking about this, who here has access to the Internet? Okay. Of those of you who did not say you had access to the Internet, how many of you know how to use a library? 
How many of you have access to the public library? Every last one of you. If you don't know how to use the internet, get down to your library, ask the librarian to help you out with resources. Believe me, librarians love this. I've been a librarian. Somebody comes in and instead of saying, where can I find this or such, or this is overdue, somebody comes in and what you're saying to them is, help save my life. You want to bet they don't feel important when you do that? Go do it for them. It's good for them too. Now, well, we talked about these three themes today. Let's see if we got everything together here. I know we've covered a lot of ground. How does it matter? Well, it matters to me to help improve my quality of life, to avoid or minimize complications. You know, I ask you to be your own best champion. Talk with your doctor about making sure you're doing everything you can to get your A1C below 7 and keep it there. It's up to you because you're the only person who lives with yourself 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Don't give away that power, that strength to anybody. What we do today helps determine how we're going to feel tomorrow. So I ask you to feel better tomorrow and today by keeping your A1C under 7%. Last and certainly not least, we're not alone. I'm not. We can't manage diabetes in isolation. My wife and grandson are in on this with me. My family and friends are journeying with me. You're not alone on this journey. Work with the people in your lives. Take and keep good control of your future. Use the resources that are right there for you. <coughs> resources, eh? There's my resources. Look at this you can find out on the internet with no problem. Uh, don't bother to write them down because Tracy knows them all. Diabetes.org, that's the American Diabetes Association. They've done more than anyone else for providing diabetes research information and best of all, advocacy. They're the folks who have made sure we don't get arrested in places like Pennsylvania just for having diabetes. Yes, people were being busted on the street for having diabetes low blood glucose reading and taken to jail. We look like we're drunk when we have a low blood glucose diabetes reading. <sighs> the American Association of Diabetes Educators, what this, si this uh, site is for is to help you locate a diabetes educator. I'll save you some steps. There's one. Before you leave here, if you have not seen Tracy, if you have not talked with her, if you have not set yourself up or gone through some of her education classes, do it before you leave here. Talk to her and get it all set up. I'm putting a lot of burden on you, Tracy. Sorry. <laughs> but education and knowing what we can do, man, that's our most valuable weapon in this fight. Diabetes Forecast is the magazine that the ADA puts out. The National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease, that provides information about how trying to understand places that have names that long. Now, the one, oh, certified diabetes educators are like gold. Treat them like precious gold. These people save lives every day of the week. Go see her. No two cases of diabetes are alike. Yours isn't the same as his, his isn't the same as mine, and so forth. What works for me doesn't work for my wife, I found out, and vice versa. Some doctors take an attitude of, if nothing else works, try insulin. But by then, it's frequently too late. Everything has started failing. Other doctors, mine, was very aggressive and said, would you like to start out on insulin and see what happens? You know, we can always titrate it. That means lower it and raise it as it's needed because it doesn't do any harm otherwise. A lot of doctors are still of the opinion that used to, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, they used to think that insulin would cause heart attacks, which if you inject it directly into the heart in massive doses, I imagine would. <clears throat> I cannot give a strong opinion on this because I'm not a medical person. I can tell you what's worked for me, and I can tell you that those are the two train of thoughts right now. Again, because your diabetes is different from anyone else's, you might be taking insulin earlier. You might be taking insulin later. Um, there's nothing to fear with insulin. We do a whole other show about insulin and how much fun it is. I find it saves a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of problems later. But again, talk to Tracy. She is really the expert on this. And help her help you become the expert on your diabetes. If you're feeling fatigued or you're feeling bad, when, when you start feeling bad, check. See what's going on. And again, get in to see her. Yours is so different, I, you know, who knows what might be happening there. I have a list of soft questions. <laughs> Good. 
it's, easy, it's actually easier for your medical team if you go in with the questions. It takes them longer, and there's some old-fashioned doctors who don't like diabetes patients because, by George, we've got questions. But as far as Tracy's concerned, as a diabetes educator, boy, that helps narrow down what the problems might be or how the program might work. Type 2 was called adult onset because it would appear in adults. They're finding that that was never really true. <laughs> Basically, type 1 means that at some point your pancreas has given up and it's dead. And you have, you're really, really dependent on insulin or you will die. Your pancreas creates insulin. When your pancreas says, that's it, I give up, you've got to get the insulin in there somehow. <clears throat> Many young people would be born without a working or functioning pancreas. That was my uh, oldest grandson. And that's why it used to be called juvenile. More and more we're starting to discover that there's a, there may be more types than just type 1 and type 2. What it looks like is there's <clears throat> a bazillion, bazillion different little diseases, and we lump them all together and call them diabetes because they all have the same symptoms. But it varies so much from person to person, it might as well be a different disease. And there has come out a um, breathing insulin right now. Um, well, yeah, that worries me because the insulin molecule, is, as one doctor explained, the insulin molecules are sometimes bigger than the air sacs in the lungs, so you don't know. Uh, again, speak with your health care team because what works for you is going to be something entirely different from me. And like I said, insulin doesn't scare me. Needles don't scare me, especially when I found out they don't hurt. And then I'm supposed to use the pointy in first. The question is, how do we get Medicare to reimburse our tests? Right now, they only cover a certain amount of strips per month to test. How do we get them to prove more so that we can take better care of ourselves? Well, I'd say the answer is write your local Congress, uh, which takes a little effort, but uh, to the congressman, maybe they'll pass a bill and maybe Medicare, Medicare will change its guidelines. A congressman in Indiana told me this, too. When you get your doctors to send in letters saying this person needs to test four times a day, five times a day, whatever, your doctors will send, uh, you know, get that letter from your doctor, send that on to Medicare. Get a copy of that and send that on to your congressman. One, the letter going into Medicare, they're tracking. Two, congressmen don't like to get pesky letters like that, and they'll do something about it. He's already pushing now for Medicare to increase it to five strips a day. Because he got tired of those letters. That's great. It, it is an expensive condition to manage. Uh, medications can cost a lot. Blood sugar test strips can cost, cost a lot. But just remember you're worth it. The quality of your life and being healthy is worth it. And you want to really focus on what your needs are and staying healthy. Prevention is the key to, to managing diabetes being in control. A lot of people don't like testing their sugar, but actually that's the best tool that we have to manage this chronic condition that we have. I don't, some days I don't know if I'm high or I'm low, but that meter, when we test our blood sugar, it gives you immediate information about what's going on inside, because this is a very sneaky, deceiving, silent disease, and it's very easy for people to ignore it. Uh, many times people think that if they feel good, then you must be all right. And to the contrary, diabetes is so silent, uh, you know, things can be happening uh, on the inside of your body that you're not even aware of. So that's why testing that sugar is really important. And so use that to your advantage. And like Chet had said, use those journals, the blood sugar journal log, so that you can make, make uh, decisions about how things affect your blood sugar level your patterns of your blood sugar. If you have pizza with pepperoni or ice cream or whatever, or pizza with ice cream, <clears throat> and you've written it down in your journal, 8 o'clock, pizza with ice cream, pizza a la mode, test again two hours later. That's the best time for testing after you've eaten two hours later. It gives it enough time to get in the system. It gives the fats enough time to get into the system. Test, and if you see, whoa, that is really high. That's a 425. You know, that ain't good. On the other hand, if you eat as I discovered, I have a bowl of spinach leaves and have a bowl of ice cream. Mine would go down. Spinach must be good for me.
I would never have known that. Now I've learned a lot of fresh spinach leaves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if you occasionally have like dessert, then it's best to omit the other carbs in your meal. Like maybe have like a chef salad or grilled chicken salad where you have your vegetables, your protein, and then you spend all your carbohydrates on that piece, small piece of dessert. Then it won't make your sugar go up as much than if you had a sandwich or soup crackers and add the dessert to that. Uh, it's not like saying go out and have dessert every day, but reality is, you know, we have lots of social functions and we like to go out and enjoy ourselves occasionally and have that dessert and enjoy that with other people. So you can do that. It is doable. When we supersize uh, our meals is when we get into trouble because then we have too much sugar in our blood. The idea is to have everything in moderation and evenly distribute your meals throughout the day. Uh, why don't you plan once a week to have that favorite dessert? Only have it earlier in the day so you can uh, burn it off. And also, you have to fit it in the meal. We can't really add dessert on top of our meal after we eat the whole meal, but we can cut down part of our meal and fit it in the meal in a small portion. You know, the, the thing that, that I didn't know until yesterday, until I had that meeting with you, that that turns to sugar. I had no clue that. I didn't know anything about fat turning to sugar. I just thought fat just goes on your body. <laughs> 20 years ago, nobody in the medical field seemed to know it either. <laughs> so it's, you know, don't, don't kick yourself for not knowing something about diabetes. And through trial and error, if you eat, a, eat some pizza for dinner and you test your sugar in the middle of the night or in the morning, you'll find out that a lot of times it's high the following day because of the high fat content. Fat slows the absorption of that food down so that, it's, that your sugar stays up high for quite a while. So you want to uh, try and stick to the, the monounsaturated fats, the good kind of fats in the diet, rather than the saturated ones. Yes? I know how to lose weight and be a diabetic at the same time. It's not working for me. It's very challenging. Uh, it can be very challenging. What uh, we what we need to do is look at your individual uh, eating habits and see where there might be areas where you can make healthier food choices. We can either cut the portions down or look at your fat content. And also exercise, physical movement plays a really important role in losing weight. You have to burn up 3,500 calories to lose one pound. And <laughs> yeah, and what I like to look at as diabetes uh, control is not following a diet. Diet is negative for many people. Diets don't work for a lot of people, and it's kind of a negative term. I like to call it healthy eating. Healthy eating works. Cutting those portions back and moving more. Getting up out of your chair uh, during commercials when you're watching TV. P parking farther away. Uh, from the store so you have further to walk. Taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Any way that you can get more movement will help your diabetes and, and your overall health. And we'd be happy, uh, we have a, a registered dietitian certified diabetes educator with our program. Uh, it might be a good idea for you to meet one on one and she could give you some suggestions. The stress hormones kick in and that sends a signal to our liver, and our liver, liver dumps out sugar, stored sugar. So stress can have an impact on our blood sugar. If you're over 300 uh, and it's a pattern for a couple days, then you need to contact your doctor, or you can meet with me after, after the presentation. And I, I don't have any more scripts, and I put the name of the scripts that the one you gave me. Okay. I'll, I'll meet with you afterwards. So basically, if you don't know why things are, are to under control, your meter's a good tool. And people say, oh, I don't want to have to test my sugar. They say, when I'm sick, I don't want to test. That's the time to test more often. And the motto I use is CSI. Does anyone in here watch CSI? Yeah, it's in a couple different states now. Uh, I'm still waiting for, you know, like CSI Hoboken or something. <laughs> well, they have the CSI uh, 
it's in Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, I call CSI for us. CSI standing for Continuous Sugar Investigation. So when someone sees you poking your finger, just tell them you're doing CSI. For, and that's for to help you understand what's going on with your body. Also, it's like gold, that information, when you take that to the doctor, that helps your physician adjust your medication or see what your body needs. And plus, it gives you feedback that you're doing all right. And it tells you when you're in trouble or... or when everything's going well. So it gives you that sense of control knowing. So are there any further questions? How would you know if you were a loved one has diabetes? The question is how would you know if a loved one had diabetes? That's a good question. Uh, diabetes is often silent and some people find out through a routine physical exam that they've got sugar in their urine or in their blood. Uh, that shows up. But some of the, the warning signs and symptoms that someone may have it are increased thirst, frequent urination, dry skin, uh, people may be getting frequent urinary tract infections or yeast infections that, that may be a clue that something else is going on. And so you want to follow up with that. And the diagnosis of diabetes is made uh, by your physician after they've completed two lab tests, fasting, lab, uh, fasting blood sugars, which are 126 or higher. Uh, if you fall into that category, then your doctor will diagnose that as diabetes. Tell them about the other test, the one where you're not fasting. That one A1 seems C to be... Test. That one seems... Well, the, the uh, two tests that they do to... Um, checked it for, to see if you have diabetes. Now, the one that's not fasting seems to be more accurate, they're telling me. Uh, the A1C test? Is, that the, is it strictly the A1C the three test? Three-month test? No, it's, um, they have two tests that they're giving. Fructosamine? There you go. I okay. think that's it. It's also uh, a test similar to the A1C test, and it measures your blood sugar control within a shorter period of time. Uh, looks at the overall average. They often use that in women that are pregnant because the control has to be near to perfect. And uh, it's a little more expensive to perform that test, uh, but it, it can be helpful as well. Your A1C test is probably your biggest marker in telling you and your providers that you're under control or whether you need further adjustment in your medication or alter excuse me, alteration in your diet or exercise plan. So A1C should be less than 7%. And what happens is our red blood cells, they circulate in our body for about three months. And whatever the blood sugar level is in the blood, what it does, the, the circulating sugar coats the hemoglobin part of the red blood cell and forms a coating on it like a candy apple. So then when you have this A1C test drawn, it tells uh, the doctor how much sugar coating is on your red blood cells. And that's a marker uh, which comes out as a percentage which translates into an average blood sugar. If we had gone back 20 years now, what was the chances when you were first diagnosed? How much did they have to go to trouble to find out you had it? I have type 1 diabetes. So that was easier to find, yeah, that's true. It's much more uh, dramatic. The, the signs are really there uh, where you're really ill, you're sick, and I had ketones in my blood, and I had ketoacidosis, so I got really, really sick. But with type 2 diabetes, it's pretty subtle, and it's very hard to detect sometimes. But it was near impossible back in the early 80s. That's true. We're really living in a wonderful time. If you have to have diabetes, there's so much available. Now, and we have Splenda. With uh, diabetes, heart disease is probably the n number one complication of diabetes. So not only do we want to control the A1C test, uh, control our blood sugar, we also need to focus on controlling our blood pressure and the cholesterol. Well, many times, the early stages of diabetes, we lose the phase of insulin in response to a meal. If we were uh, trying to prevent diabetes and diagnosis, diagnose it at an earlier date, 
it would almost be more effective if we would test postprandial after meal blood sugars because it's going to show up there before it's going to show up fasting. The, the thing is, ways that didn't work are still being used by a lot of folks who they're still learning what we have learned. Um, there's a lot of folks I know who they went to med school back in 72. Therefore, they know everything about diabetes up to what we knew in 72. And they haven't really studied since. <laughs> and I can't blame them. Look, they've got to keep track of, you know, cardiology and bones and this and that. How can they keep? The only somebody who does it full time, like her, can keep up with it. And also, 99, you know, you're going along at 99, it seems fine for a while because of when you're testing. But diabetes is so darn sneaky that it can suddenly, not only can it come on you suddenly, but you might have had it all along and just been being tested wrong. Or it could be the fact that you just had some extra stressor come into your life and kick it into gear. Remember, most of the time, your pancreas is trying to keep up with you. You know, you do a whole lot of, oh, I'll have another piece of cake, thank you, give me those donuts. And your pancreas, <laughs> doing all it can to pump out as much insulin as it can. And you're coming up with readings of 90 and 95 and 99, no problem. Your pancreas finally goes, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly you're at 125, 200. Because your pancreas just quit all at once. And you can't blame it, it's tired. <laughs> Diabetes does progress. It grows in experience as we do. We don't really relate the insulin to calories. We, we relate it to what your body needs in a 24-hour period and also the content of carbohydrates that you eat at the meal. Yeah, okay. I'm afraid taking more insulin. I had a friend who thought he'd take more insulin and he'd get rid of all, and he'd lose weight, he'd think. He said, insulin doesn't do a thing for calories. It has nothing to do with calories. You know, um, comparing carbohydrates, glucose, sugar in the bloodstream. Glucose is the fuel, like gas for our car. Calories is like saying miles per gallon. It does one of two things. It does what it's supposed to. Insulin does what it's supposed to. It puts the energy where you want it. If you're exercising, it puts it into muscle. If we're not exercising, it stores it, and that's called fat. <laughs> and that's what happens before, we're, you know, when your pancreas is working. That's a normal human body. And even storing it in fat is still better than having the sugar running along through your bloodstream, just attacking and destroying nerve endings and making you blind or something. So it's better if we would just exercise, do some physical activity, um, but still it's better than the alternative. <laughs> yeah. you know, as long as we're not dead, we have alternatives, and if we let ourselves get knocked into death, we've lost our alternatives. Um. I'm not yet on insulin, but what determines with that day when you do go on insulin? D-Day? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> insulin is not a bad thing, and once, a lot of times people avoid it like the plague, and their blood sugar controls in the high 2 to 300s, on, they're maxed out on oral agents, and they're just fearful of going on that shot. And generally, in the past, you know, we have this phobia needles probably... Uh, as a result of when we were children, we got these vaccinations, these big, long needles in our muscle, and they hurt. And the, the needles we use and the instruments we use to deliver insulin are much less painful. They're microfine. You can't even feel it, just like Chet said. So the stomach is my favorite place to, to let the, uh, for the insulin delivery. Folks, at our age, you can hardly see an insulin needle. <laughs> And you remember what I answered her when she asked that same question? The answer still applies. It's all up to you, really. In my case, I had a doctor that was aggressive and said, how about we attack this with insulin now? And I said, you know, if it'll save steps, you know, my problem is I don't have enough insulin. Okay, it makes sense. Wasn't wild about it, but um, it saved me a lot of steps and a lot of time. <laughs> so it's really up to you more than anything or anyone else. No, they, they, if, if it comes to the point where you've been saying, no insulin, no insulin, no insulin, no insulin, no insulin, all your life, and they say, okay, well, you're going to die, and then you say, all right, I'll have insulin now. Well, it might be too late by then. 
But at any rate, the choice is always up to you. And, and if, you're not on, if you are on oral agents and they're not working and you're not under control, then it's not working. The doctor may try you on some insulin, and that may be the key uh, to getting you under control. Yeah, the pancreas has stopped. Hey, folks, where are you going to get the insulin you need if you don't inject it? If your heart stopped, you know, if, if you stopped creating blood, would you mind if somebody put a little in you? Okay, we, I, I think we really need to shut yeah, down. Okay. I, we've kept you here and we've kept them here. Okay. And, and Tracy is, like, I hope she's on overtime for this. Oh, I'm, on, I'm here today. So okay. All day. <laughs> Folks, Thank please you. get in her class. What you have had here the past hour and so minutes is just a taste, no pun intended, just a taste of what you can learn and get. To, this is power. This is real power that she has that she can offer to you. And, you know, you'll, you'll ask questions about, well, how is it that I can, you know, I, I cut down on my eating and I'm still gaining weight. Get in her class, do the one-on-one, -on -one, and she can take the time with you and look at your records. I'm serious. I have yet to see a person go to see a CDE that, did, that followed the CDE's counsel that did not improve at least 100%. These people do miracles, and we owe them a lot. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Oops. Uh -huh.